Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dave Deptula, AFA's uh, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies. And welcome to the release of our new research study, Long Range Strike, Resetting the Balance uh, of Stand-In and Stand-Off Forces. As implied by the title, the report addresses the need to balance the Air Force's future mix of long range strike capabilities. Now the study was researched and written by Mr. Mark Gunzinger, uh, Mitchell's Director of Future Concepts and Capability Assessments. He was a B-52 pilot, longtime planner on the air staff, a director of the National Security Council staff, and a Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense. To his friends and fans, he's known as Gonzo. So welcome Gonzo and thanks for your superb effort. Uh, this paper should help inform the debate over the future size and mix of the Air Force Bomber Force. We're also very honored to host Lieutenant General Dave Nahom and Brigadier General Mike Winkler today. General Nahom is the Air Force's Deputy Chief of Staff for Plans and Programs, and General Winkler is the Pacific Air Force's Director of Strategic Plans, Requirements, and Programs. So welcome, gentlemen. And thanks very much for joining us on uh, Aerospace Nation. The way we'll get started is with a presentation on the context and content of the study, um, followed by brief remarks from our guest speakers, uh, and then we'll move into questions and answers. So Gonzo, over to you for your presentation. Hey, thank you, General Deptua and General Lahome and General Winkler for uh, joining us today. Really appreciate that. And I'll bring up the slides. Okay, so right into it. Uh, this briefing really is uh, an overview of the report itself. We begin by explaining what we mean by standoff and uh, stand in or penetrating strike, and then describes uh, two issues which motivated us to write this report to begin with. First, our nation as a whole lacks long-range strike capacity. The services divested many of their long-range strike systems uh, over the last few years for many reasons, including budgetary. Uh, DOD's shift toward planning for great power competition and conflict has greatly increased the need for long-range strike capabilities, and those capabilities are going to be absolutely critical, as discussed in our national defense strategy, for rapidly defeating Chinese or Russian aggression, and preventing them from achieving a fate complete. Second issue, today our nation's long-range strike force mix is also imbalanced. And by that I mean, you know, long-range strike can be accomplished by ships and subs and vertical launch systems as well as uh, uh, ground launchers and aircraft. Quick point, all of those systems are standoff strike capabilities except for the Air Force's 20 B-2 bombers. I also want to emphasize that when you think about our nation's bomber force, uh, it is the only force that can bring the degree of mass and precision into the future battle space that will be needed by theater commanders. So we go on to report to talk about factors the DOD planners need to consider as they seek to rebuild DOD's long-range strike force. And finally, we address the feasibility of a new standoff uh, arsenal play and how it might fit into the picture. So right into it, there are two basic approaches conducting a long range strike. I already mentioned them, uh, standoff and penetrating, which includes aircraft that can penetrate uh, into contested and highly contested airspace as illustrated on this slide. Now our report focuses on long range strike capabilities of the Air Force, not all of the services. Uh, just to scope down the issue, but many of the principles we talk about in the report would apply to uh, other standoff strike capabilities. And stand-in strikes use stealth bombers to penetrate those defenses and release munitions in close proximity to targets, as you see on the side, where a standoff uh, platforms, including aircraft, must launch longer range weapons that could travel hundreds of miles before they, they strike the target. So, Couple of issues with today's bomber force. It's too small. And it's a well-known fact that it's now the smallest and oldest bomber force the Air Force has ever operated since its uh, uh, foundation as a separate service in 1947. In fact, 
the smallest bomber force the nation's ever had since 1941. There are now 158 total bombers in the force, which is down from about 411 at the end of the Cold War. And Congress has also noticed this and expressed their concern with the diminished size of the force. They may actually establish a floor for the future inventory. Now the uh, Air Force's FY21 budget proposed cutting an additional 17 B1s to plow the savings back into sustaining the rest of the force and funding other long range strike uh, capabilities. And the Air Force has also said it needs a minimum of 220 total bombers to uh, execute the national defense strategy at a low to moderate level of risk, which is represented by the uh, black line in the middle of the slide. And other studies have recommended force size, the bomber force size between that black line and the green line on top of the slide. And the good news is that B-21s are going to begin to join the service uh, uh, later this decade, and they will eventually replace B-1Bs and B-2 bombers. So, you know, a really a better way of thinking about long range strike capacity is what can the force generate in the way of combat sorties? Now this chart starts with the total inventory on the left side uh, column in FY21, next it down to primary mission bombers actually assigned to combat units. And over on the right side, after applying mission capable rates, uh, you come up with theoretically 30 sorties a day, potentially uh, it could be generated to support a theater commander. And for context, B-52s, my old aircraft, flew about 50 sorties per day during Operation Desert Storm in 1991. And I'd like to point out one other thing. Not all of these sorties are the same. Only B-2s have the stealth technologies, computing power, and other mission systems that allow them to penetrate uh, contested areas. And the number of penetrating sorties they can uh, generate per day would back down to probably single digit numbers. So as General Goldfein has said, multiple war games have shown the force that wins in the future will have the right balance of both stand-in and standoff strike capabilities. Today, the bomber force and DOD's long range strike capabilities does not have the right mix. Our report does point out why both are needed. We're not bad-mouthing standoff capabilities. Uh, it certainly has its advantages. And I've listed some of them on this slide, such as both standoff and penetrating bombers can respond to a theater from out of theater, possibly on night one of a conflict, and take the fight uh, uh, to the enemy. Both increase survivability of the force, one by having the uh, capability to penetrate, and the other by launching uh, standoff weapons without penetrating. Uh, but of course, standoff aircraft need to use long range weapons, whereas penetrating aircraft can use shorter range and direct attack weapons as well. So that drives some differences in the kinds of targets that they can uh, uh, place at risk. And it also creates trade offs between factors such as weapon size, weapons delivered per sortie, costs to attack targets, and so forth. And this gets us to the uh, meat of the report those trade-offs. So factors that DOD planners should consider. First, uh, of course, target sets may be very different than what coalition air forces attacked during us as a storm. And by way of context, that was about 40,000 aim points during the Desert Storm air campaign. Uh, you could add probably many tens of thousands uh, to that number for a major conflict with China and Russia. Now, on the upper left-hand side, you see this, all these red dots on China. That is a unclassified target set we developed from uh, open sources. And each one of those circles is a cluster of potential aim points like airfields and uh, ASATs and, and so forth. Also illustrated on that slide is China and Russia can use their great strategic depth to their benefit by posturing some of their high value asset, assets deep in their interior making it more difficult to, uh, uh, to strike them from standoff ranges. Other countermeasures that uh, enemies are employing, mobility, mobilizing their uh, key weapon systems, hardening those systems they can't mobilize, deeply burying them, camouflage, uh, active and passive defenses, all intended to degrade the effectiveness of US precision strikes. However, many of these countermeasures have 
a greater impact on standoff strikes, and I'll cover some of them. For example, let's take depth. I have some penetrating bombers on this slide. The fact of the matter is, if you do the math, uh, a penetrating bomber with a B-2 light combat radius, say 2,500 to 3,000 nautical miles, if it can refuel before it penetrates, it can strike any target on the face of the Earth. Plus, it opens up multiple axis attacks, which complicates an enemy's defenses and now must defend its interior. So it's a cost imposing capability as well. Standoff bombers, in contrast, uh, are limited first by how close the non stealth aircraft can approach contested areas and by the range of its weapons. And, and this slide illustrates that relationship by using two standoff ranges, 550 nautical miles on the left and 800 nautical miles on the right. Uh, assuming a beef 2 is loaded with JASM ER-like weapons, which has a, a acknowledged range of greater than 500 nautical miles, you can see the number of aim points that could be physically reached by those weapons uh, begins to uh, uh, drop significantly. And theoretically, 800 nautical miles standoff or further, uh, Jasmiers might not be able to reach any aim points on the EMI, so on the mainland. So weapons with longer ranges could indeed strike some of those targets at those greater standoff distances, but that can drive other operational and cost trade-offs, which I'll briefly summarize. Now, countermeasures, Enemies countermeasures affects weapons and strikes of all kinds. But again, the impact can be greater on standoff strikes. Now the picture on the upper left-hand side is from the previous slide, 550 nautical miles standoff. What we did on the right-hand side is we simply eliminated potential hardened and deeply buried targets and highly mobile or relocatable targets such as mobile SAMs, missile tells, and so forth. Now, broadly speaking, long range weapons can't carry warheads that are large enough to penetrate very hard and deeply buried targets. And weapons with long flight times, such as a subsonic cruise missile launched from 500 nautical miles or more standoff distance, won't reach aim points for tens of minutes. Now, if that weapon strikes its predetermined, pre programmed aim point with great precision, but the target's no longer there, well, that's a win for the enemy. In contrast, penetrating bombers can carry much larger weapons to create the right kinds of effects in the hard and deeply buried targets, and they can approach defended targets uh, more closely, so the flight times of their weapons are measured in just a few minutes, which increases their effectiveness against highly mobile uh, targets. Again, we're not saying standoff weapons would have zero effectiveness against these kind of targets. We're just illustrating the principle. Here's another one. Now, campaign success can hinge on putting as many weapons on targets as quickly as possible early in air campaigns. Now, General Goldfein has uh, been quoted as saying, the ability to complete thousands of kill chains and hundreds of hours may be needed in a future great power concept or conflict. So, this slide on the left shows that the B-2 can carry 80 500-pound JDAMs internally or 16 larger JASMs. And I'm not implying equivalency between these two weapons and the kinds of effects they can create and so forth, just illustrating that size of weapons matters and it can drive number of aim points you can attack per sortie. So the rest of the slide is simple math. It uses two different force mixes of standoff and penetrating bombers to uh, illustrate this point. The red colored force of 200 penetrating and 50 standoff bombers would take about 10 days to strike a given number of targets required by a theater commander and its mere image force of 50 penetrators and 200 standoff aircraft since it has a lower uh, target per sortie count to take uh, over three times the amount of time to strike the same number of targets. So I'll mention another trade-off. Cost of weapons generally increases with their range and sophistication. Standoff weapons, uh, long-range standoff weapons need power plants, need to carry fuel, uh, guidance systems, possibly terminal seeker, maybe a data link. All those things add cost to a weapon. Remember, this is a one-time use uh, 
uh, capability. All that is thrown away after the, the weapon has done its job. So affordability is a major issue if your requirement is to kill multiple thousands, tens of thousands of targets. And this simple example uh, assumes 4,800 aim points per day must be attacked, which is similar to the rate they're attacked during Operation Desert Storm. And the cost of using million dollar plus weapons against all those aim points, well, it's ridiculous. It's, it's simply not affordable. That's why you need a mix of penetrating uh, capabilities can deliver lower cost, direct attack, and short range standoff weapons, not just the long range expensive capabilities. And as you see on the bottom right side of the slide, DD and the Air Force isn't planning on buying anywhere near the number of uh, JASM that uh, would be required to do what's on the left side of the chart. So this chart reproduces an illustration from a 2010 RAND study that helped inform DOD's decision to start the B-21 program. Basically, it shows that after 20 days of airstrikes, buying a penetrating bomber and its less expensive direct attack weapons is more cost effective than expending cruise missiles on the same number of targets. Now, in this slide, RAND include the cost of weapons that were used by both aircraft, but it didn't count the cost of the standoff attack platform. It did include the procurement and 30 year ONS costs for a, a new penetrating bomber. So we did, we updated this with those costs and we assumed the cost for a new penetrator would be about 400 million, possibly more than that. It's in our report. We took a look at uh, a new old buy a C-17s modified to carry weapons or a commercial derivative arsenal plane or a new start uh, a design. If that holds true, as you can see on the right, well, the costs favor penetrating bombers uh, uh, even more. The breakpoint shifts to 10 to 15 days, depending on uh, the weapons employed by the standoff uh, uh, platform arsenal plane, hypersonic cruise missiles or, or JASM ERs. So one other thing, uh, our report talks about time. How much time would it uh, require to develop and field a, um, a commercial derivative arsenal plane or a new start or modify uh, other aircraft to do that? So we took a look at major new aircraft programs stretching back to 1980 up till today. And on average, the Air Force is required about five to six years between when a contract was um, established for a new aircraft program and at aircraft's first flight, another four or five years on top of that before the first operational uh, jet was delivered. So if that track record holds true, then it wouldn't be until the early 2030s at best that a new arsenal plane would be available uh, to the force. And we're talking um, a time frame will probably be at full rate production to be 21, to say nothing about that new arsenal plane could compete with resources uh, that you need for the, the greater requirement, which is war penetra penetrating strike capacity. So last slide, Air Force uh, should increase its long range strike capacity. We recommend a force of 316 bombers. We explain our force sizing methodology and it falls between, as other studies have recommended, the Air Force is uh, at least 220 and the, uh, the upper level in the Cold War. 411. And as the Air Force rebuilds its bomber force, it should emphasize penetrating strike. And if you assume the Air Force keeps all of its uh, B-52s to get the 316, simple math, it'd be around 420 total uh, B-21s. We recommend hypersonic weapons are needed. Of course, fifth gen platforms need fifth gen weapons, as the Air Force and others have said. But the trade-offs I've talked about on weapon size and cost and range and so forth, they apply to hypersonic weapons as well. We point that out in the report. Uh, allocating modified airlift aircraft, C-17, C-130s to do strike missions doesn't really make operational sense, at least not in the early days of a crisis response to appear conflict because those aircraft are going to be needed for their primary mission, deploying and sustaining the joint force. We already have arsenal planes. They're called B-52s and, and B-1s. Uh, and a new arsenal plane will not be quicker or cheaper 
It could drain resources from the greater need. So I'll close by saying uh, thank you, not uh, just to everyone on the panel, but also to the broader Mitchell uh, Institute staff, Doug Berkey, Major General Stutzrein, and Camilla Gunzinger for uh, so their support during this project. General Tatua, back to you. Okay, thanks very much for that uh, rundown, uh, Gonzo. Um, I, I encourage everyone out there to pick up the report and actually read it. Uh, Gonzo gave it a, a, a pretty good uh, a summary, but always the devil's in the details. So let's turn now to uh, General Winkler and get his perspectives um, on this general subject area from uh, his perspective uh, out there in the Pacific. Uh, General Winkler, over to you. Okay, thanks, sir. I appreciate it. It's, uh, it's great to see you again, and thanks for hosting this, uh, this forum. It's an awesome opportunity for us to get some words out uh, from here in the Pacific. Uh, to the entire crowd, uh, aloha from here in Hawaii, and, and good morning from headquarters back aft. Uh, on behalf of General C.Q. Brown, the commander of the Pacific Air Forces, I'm honored to be here to give you a little bit of a Pacific perspective, especially as it pertains to, uh, to Gonzo's great brief in the, uh, in the bomber force that the United States Air Force currently possesses. Uh, I guess I'd start by congratulating Gonzo on, on what I thought was a, a really well-written paper and a thought-provoking presentation uh, and look forward to being able to field some of the questions as it relates to that uh, coming forward. Um, you know, one of our main roles out here at headquarters PACAF uh, is as the air component to Indo-PACOM's joint war fighting team, our joint force air, command, uh, air component commander responsibilities, if you will. If you will. So uh, we are basically the war fighting arm for all things related to the air domain. And I would have said air and space domain a couple of months ago, but uh, some recent changes in that have us predominantly focused on the air domain. Uh, hopefully that's the context that I'll be able to, uh, to provide to today's conversation. Um, you know, as Indo-PACOM's air component, we're also part of the joint force. Uh, I'd be happy to take some comments or, uh, or make some comments or take some questions on how the joint force both supports and relies on the air power that the United States Air Force provides. Uh, and maybe even some commentary on, on how our teammates out here in the Pacific on the joint side of the house view the importance of air power because it, it is very important to the joint force and critical to being able to, to get the job done uh, in either a deterrent or a war fighting mission. And, and hopefully I'll have a chance to comment on both of those roles throughout the presentation. Uh, it's also an honor to be here uh, on the same panel as my good friend, Lieutenant General Dave ne Nahum. Uh, we've been stationed together uh, a number of times and I've known him for decades. Uh, he has definitely uh, gotten a lot more insight than I do into the budgetary stuff, some of the future force design, and where the Air Force is going with procurement. And I will defer all tough questions related to those things uh, to him and try to keep my comments focused on the, the war fighting part in the Pacific. Uh, you know, ultimately, uh, Headquarters PACAF, as part of that war fighting component for Indo-PACOM, we're a consumer of air power. We're, we're a consumer of the combat capability that Headquarters Air Force and the United States Air Force provides. Uh, and basically an end user of that. And, and hopefully that's where I'll be able to keep my comments focused today on is, uh, you know, basically on the efficacy of the strike platforms and the different ways that we can provide those as so well laid out by Gonzo in his presentation. Uh, so again, I, happy to be here and, and look forward to the questions and the discussion that we'll have today. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, General Nahum, uh, over to you and uh, look forward to hearing your perspectives before we jump into the uh, detailed uh, Q&A. All right. Well, well, thanks, sir. Again, uh, thanks to uh, Mitchell Institute for having me on I, uh, once again here and twice in, in a couple months. Uh, uh, it's a, it's definitely an honor to be here. Uh, Gonzo, thanks for the paper. I, I really, I did enjoy the read. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, it is it is spot on right now for the time we're here in the building. As long range strike, long range fires seems to be uh, just the uh, the big topic around here right now. So having your perspectives are absolutely uh, wonderful uh, right now for us. Uh, thanks to everyone who's on, online today. I know uh, we have a lot of, of, of friends from industry out there. Uh, I know we, we're in a time of unprecedented challenges, uh, not only with the national defense uh, needs, but also the COVID challenges we're all dealing with. You know, from my, from my perspective here in the headquarters Air Force, watching our airmen deal with these COVID challenges, it's just been unbelievable uh, how they adapt and, uh, and, they, and they, they get their mission done. And I know the same thing is happening with industry, and I, and I just can't thank everyone enough for that. Um, you know, here in the, here in the, that, uh, from the half perspective, uh, you know, we're looking at the national defense strategy, 
um, and uh, and really is our guide crystal right now as we as we look to design a force for the future. And it really does steer us towards pure competition, uh, China and Russia. Uh, and it, it's challenging because uh, we are we, we do have limitations with our top line. Uh, we don't see that top line going up in the in the near future. Uh, I, I call the best where the best case flat top line is what we're dealing with right now, and even that is challenging trying to get where, where we want to, where we want to go. Uh, we're fortunate to have a new A5 in General High Note. I know we just spoke to your crowd uh, not too long ago, sir, um, and having his his group really really wrestle with that design. You know, what should we look like in the future? And then my job, as Jekyll alluded to, the money piece is how do we get there? Uh, and uh, it, it's and it's not always easy. I'll, I'll tell you. You hear a lot of work words about legacy. You know, we got to invest legacy. It's a really nice buzzword. It's really nice to say, but it's really, really hard because when you say legacy in the Air Force, that's a lot of stuff that we have in our Air Force right now with airmen operating it all over the world, doing missions. And right now, as we sit here, all comfortable uh, here inside the Beltway, getting shot at and risking their lives. So getting rid of legacy. Uh, le leaves problems around the world uh, if you just take it on space. You know, I, I say there's a really good tension that goes on right now between us here in the headquarters as we try to modernize in the NDS and our combatant commanders and Jekyll uh, in, in, at the uh, the MAGCOM with the combatant commander there in the Pacific is they got to deal with the day-to-day -day operations. And that tension is really good because we would like to spend a lot more money on modernization and they need they need to spend a lot more money on current day operations, and we have to find that uh, find that right fit and, uh, and that right balance, and that's what we strive to uh, every day. So, uh, that I'll uh, I'll go to your question, sir. Uh, but again, thanks for having us on board. It's uh, great to be here today. Um, well, thanks very much, uh, General Nahum, uh, and uh, both of you uh, for your uh, comments and uh, perspective. So let's jump jump into the topic uh, in a little bit more uh, detail. Um, I'm going to address a question to each of our panelists, but I'd be, like to really make this conversational, so each of you are welcome to jump in uh, as appropriate. So let me kick off the uh, first question to General on Nahum. Um, Mitchell's studies focus more on rebalancing uh, the long-range strike force mix rather than the total number of bombers that may be needed in the future. Um, but that said, um, multiple government and independent analyses have concluded that the bomber force is now too small. So while the Air Force has said it needs about 220 bombers, um, Abu, would you agree that 220 is really a living number that's likely to change over time? Uh, and, and that being so, what are some of the key factors um, that would affect uh, the Air Force's uh, bomber requirements? Okay. Um, Yes, sir, it, it's a great question, and I know that the total number comes up a lot. First, I'll say uh, balance is a great question, and it's not just about balancing bombers that, uh, uh, that Gonzo talks about uh, so well in his paper and his presentation, but it's about balancing an Air Force, too. Um, you know, we, uh, we, do, we do believe that 220 bombers or more is a requirement because the long-range strike and then the ability of the B-21 not only to, to strike from outside the contested areas, but actually uh, penetrate inside contested areas, uh, is going to give uh, options for combatant commanders for, for, for a long time coming, and, uh, and we know we need that capability. Um, 220, I, I would say, is a bit of a living number uh, because we're going to strive to get there. I'm not sure how quick we're going to get there, give, given the top lines that I see in the, in the near future, but that's the number we want to get to, uh, and then potentially more. I know in Gonzo's paper, he actually talks about even more than that, which we get. But at the same time, uh, you know, I got to balance a, a fleet of nearly 500 tankers, nearly 2,000 fighters, and many of those fleets uh, it need to be modernized as well. So uh, it, it's going to be a key balance. Uh, factors, you talk about that. I think one thing that you know, we're going to watch is as we build out our ABMS, our Advanced Battle Management System Network, and how that feeds into the broader Joint All Domain Command and Control Network that is going to be fed by Navy system, Marine systems, Army systems, space systems. Um, how that develops over the next couple of years, I, I think will change what the requirements look like. We may need more long range strike or we may need less. I think we have to be very open minded to what that's going to do to change the way we fight because the, the ability to bring uh, information and data. That machine speeds to warfighter is, is going to change the way we fight going forward. I think it's going to change in ways that we don't even we can't even envision yet. We, we know it's going to be better, 
but there's things that we just can't even envision yet in, in a world with, with a true all domain network. I know. Thanks for that perspective, um, Abu. Uh, I think it's a it's extraordinarily important one. It's one that certainly the chief has uh, uh, focused uh, uh, his tenure on trying to get people uh, to understand. Um, going back to Desert Storm, U.S. commanders have had the benefit of a nearly uh, unrestricted access to regional bases, a few threats to stand off weapons, and the ability to operate non-stealth aircraft over much of the battle space. Um, this drove certain assumptions regarding our long-range strike force mix. Uh, how has the return to peer competition altered these assumptions, uh, and what might that portend for long-range strike requirements? And then, I, actually, Jekyll, I, after uh, 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 General Nahum has a chance to answer that, I'd like to get your perspective, too. Okay, sir. It's an interesting question. Um, yeah, obviously, it's a... Um, uh, uh, it, it changed, changed immensely, and ha you know, having uh, I think one of the last people on I'm one of the last few people on active duty that flew in Desert Storm, so I, I don't like to say that around here too much. It makes me feel really old. Um, but um, I think the big thing is the air defenses. I mean, I, it's just it's changed so much in our in what and in, in what we expect we can and can't do in the future, whether it's a uh, a European Kaliningrad type scenario or whether we're in the South China Sea in, in some respects. Um, I think the big thing, um, and we're really having a very robust discussion, great discussion right now, and all the joint players are coming into it, is I don't think we have the sanctuary we thought we had, even five, ten years ago. And that's not just about air bases. That's about, you, you name the point of defense. You name the thing that we that we need for the war fight that's going to be inside, um, uh, really, the second island chain or even, even further out. Uh, whether it's uh, uh, an A-pod, an S-pod, a, a submarine base, an air base, a, a long-range fire point in the Army, uh, everything is, is not going to be the sanctuary we thought it's going to be. So I think it makes us look at uh, look at things differently. I certainly look at the ability to launch uh, bombers from some sanctuary, from very far away, outside of the air, uh, and be able to get places in hours, not days. Um, and be able to uh, uh, penetrate or not penetrate enemy air defenses uh, and take out targets at a, at a time place for choosing. So it definitely makes me, me look at things differently. I think the all, all other things you have to look at too is in Desert Storm, we had some, we had some incredible access back then. We had a lot of bases in Saudi Arabia and other surrounding other surrounding countries. Um, access is going to be tough. You know that, that that those are those things cannot be assumed away. So to say that we're going to have rights to use bases and areas. Uh, and to do what we want in those bases and areas may not be the way we the way we envision it, especially especially in areas uh, in the Pacific. So, uh, I think long range strike uh, from bombers, certainly from uh, from bases that we control, and maybe even in the states, uh, is uh, it makes this, this uh, a very different discussion. I think going forward, and you know, if we can get to a 220 bomber fleet. We have the ability for a B-21 that can not only shoot from the outside, but then penetrate air defenses and then shoot from the inside. You think about the flexibility with what our Air Force is going to bring in the future is, uh, is going to be game changing. Very good. John Winkler, your thoughts? Hey, sir. Thanks for the chance to comment on this. Uh, I largely agree with what, what General Nahum uh, discussed out here. You know, some of the, the unique um, factors in the Indo-Pacific are uh, it, it's a really, really large theater. Uh, I think a lot of people don't understand how far some of the distances to travel are. Uh, you know, even from the second island chain to get to mainland China is about the equivalent of, of flying from Washington, D.C. Uh, to Dallas-Fort Worth. Uh, and those are, are distances that we're typically not used to doing with our fighter fleet, although we have become very used to doing them uh, with our bomber fleet, like you mentioned, even back in Desert Storm. Um, I, I think regardless of whether we're talking about the stand-in or the stand-off capabilities that Gonzo brought up in his brief, uh, the reality for our bomber fleet out here in the Pacific when employed is that they'll be flying really, really long sorties. And what that's driven by a little bit is, uh, you know, I'd say our adversaries, it's probably mostly China's anti-access, area denial, umbrella, and their combination of cruise missiles and ballistic missiles that can put basically all bases that we've got within the second island chain under risk. So we talked a little bit about the size of our bomber fleet. Uh, I think regardless of how many we end up building, we're probably always going to treat those as low density, high demand, critical assets. Uh, and I think in a war game, if we were planning on basing those in the second island chain, we'd probably take more losses on the ground uh, 
uh, because of those cruise and ballistic missiles than we would in the air. So that's going to force the bomber fleet to, like General Nahum mentioned, fly some, uh, some really, really long range sorties. Uh, the, the other thing I'd mention from an access standpoint, again, I agree with General Nahum. I, we don't want to assume that we're going to get access in too many places in the Indo-Pacific. And really, there's not much land uh, that's left available outside of China's anti-access area denial umbrella right now. But the other key thing to, to enabling a bomber to be successful in combat is I need to make a logistics investment ahead of time. So some of the accesses that we think we may get as a conflict is, uh, is coming. They may be late breaking. We're going to find that a country is on our side in there and, and willing to allow us to base U.S. forces out of their nation. But we're going to have a time lag there and not be able to do the logistics preparation of that airfield to be able to support bomber operations. Uh, with bombers are a little bit unique in, in the fact that you're gonna need uh, large munitions requirements and, and those require explosive storage and some other things that we just can't create on the fly. So uh, again, I agree that with General Nahum on uh, the majority of his answers and, and it is a, a big problem for us regardless of whether you're talking about the stand-in or the standoff force. Uh, well, thanks uh, General Winkler, who by the way, uh, for our audience, if you haven't figured it out, his call sign is Jekyll. Um, let's, let's turn to uh, standoff strikes for a moment. Um, there must be quite a discussion in uh, Indo-PACOM uh, about how far the Chinese can continue to push out the safe line from which U.S. forces can launch standoff weapons from either sea or from land. Uh, could you talk about this a little bit in the views of those who think that the balance should be heavily weighted in favor of standoff weapons? Uh, absolutely, sir. Uh, you know, we were talking before the, uh, the presentation. I, I think I told you that, uh, you know, I'm living that, that happens to be a Chinese, ancient Chinese curse of may you live in interesting times. Uh, and the Chinese certainly are making our lives interesting out here in the Indo-Pacific. Um, you know, one of the interesting parts about that, we're never sure, we're never certain of what the next procurement capability China is going to pursue to be able to further bolster their anti-access area denial umbrella. You know, we don't know if their next step is going to be increasing that range to further out in the Pacific uh, or bolstering the defenses, you know, under their current range of building additional weapon systems that they can employ in those to try to keep the United States out of the second island chain. Uh, those, so because of that uncertainty, I think we always advocate out here in the Indo-Pacific that we want to keep our options open. Uh, and I think Gonzo's presentation kind of talked about a mix of stand-in and stand-off probably being required and how you don't want to overly rely on one or the other. Uh, you know, our, our concerns for that, I guess, are if we overly rely on it, on our stand-in capabilities, that's a heavy investment in a lot of exquisite technology uh, that may be challenging to be able to sustain over time or in the current budgetary fights. Um, but having said that, if you do overinvest in that, it does drive a significant reinvestment of the ad. So basically, uh, those exquisite capabilities can render a lot of the anti-access area denial umbrella useless for China. Uh, it, it basically renders all of their future investments in it, uh, you know, it, impotent at that point in time. And they'll have to go back and make significant reinvestments to rebuild that anti-access area denial umbrella. Uh, confer conversely, if we just continually rely on the standoff capabilities, uh, as, as Gonzo's mentioned, there's a, a number of ways that, uh, that our adversaries can counter those capabilities. They can continue to build out the ranges further and further and further, and eventually that'll drive the United States to have to buy a whole new class of weapons that can shoot from that further range all the way back in uh, to where the anti-access area denial umbrella is. Um, and also that, that probably doesn't, uh, I think Gonzo mentioned this as well, it's not as cost imposing of a strategy because the improvements to the Chinese IADs and things to counter the standoff force are a lot less of an investment for them. Um, so I, I both are required. I think ultimately uh, it's a mix of capabilities that give us the best options. General Nahum's kind of laid this out already, but the, the magic or, or the art here is trying to figure out what that right mix is uh, and, and not overly rely on one capability or the other capability. Um, the other thing I'd point out from a standoff uh, perspective is uh, our standoff force cannot see the targets that it is shooting at. So it, it's going to have to rely on intel, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets to be able to generate those targets to, to strike them. Uh, a lot of the targets that we're interested here in the Pacific are, uh, are mobile targets. And I think Gonzo's presentation talked about the difficulty in the flight times of long range weapons to try to hit mobile targets and, and how we might hit a precise set of coordinates, but that mobile target has moved. Um, so I, 
you know, from an investment standpoint, I'd also point out that the standoff force relies on a heavy investment in the ISR fleet to be able to support the targeting and enable that whole find, fix, track, target, engage part of the kill chain. I would say also, though, the Air Force is making some significant improvements in, uh, in both uh, joint all domain command and control uh, and our airborne uh, battle management systems. Uh, we've got some promising capabilities that are on the horizon that may end up helping with the, uh, the ISR problem for the standoff fleet. Uh, but I don't think we're there quite yet. And, and again, I think that just further underscores why we need a mix of capabilities. Well, listen, Jekyll, uh, Jekyll thanks very much for that, particularly bringing into the equation uh, the importance of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance as the first Air Force chief of uh, ISR. Um, I like to remind people that, you know, if we, we, we really have uh, uh, worked the last hundred years trying to figure out how to hit any target anywhere on the surface of the earth, all weather, day, night, rapidly and with precision. We can do that. The issue is, what do you want to hit? And what's the desired effect that you want to achieve? Uh, and, and so that's a critical part of the equation too. It's not just about the platforms or the weapons. It's also about the knowledge, which also gets to the point that um, Abu and others uh, have made in the context of rapidly sharing information in a ubiquitous and seamless fashion, which is the heart of um, uh, the JADC2 effort. So let me uh, take a second here to shift over and give uh, Gonzo a chance to jump into the discussion. Um, Gonzo, your report talks about trade-offs between the ranges of standoff weapons, the size and weight of their payloads, unit cost, and their survivability. Um, while your report doesn't specifically address standoff missiles launched by sea-based undersea and ground platforms, wouldn't these same trade-offs apply to them? Uh, and uh, could, could you expand a little bit on this notion? You're absolutely right, uh, General Deftua. All of the trade-offs uh, I've talked about in terms of weapon size, weapon costs, sophistication and range apply to uh, other modalities of launching these weapons. Uh, even more so in some cases. Now, I've long been a fan of Army long-range fires in Europe. Considering the ranges, you know, five, 600 uh, kilometers, uh, it, it makes sense. But then again, the weapons will cost, uh, uh, will not be as much a factor as the kind of service-to-service -service fires you'd have to have along the first island chain to reach the coastline of China, much less deep into China. Uh, if, if your weapon is priced out at 15 to 20 million dollars each, that's not a level of effort weapon. That's not the kind of thing that would use, you would use to knock down thousands of targets. Uh, I'm not saying they'd be totally useless. Of course, they could target some very, very, very high value targets. But you have to think about not just the mix inside the Air Force, but the mix across DOD as well. And you have to think about the differences in theaters, the range, the basing, uh, the relative difficulty in resupplying uh, fire units that you'd posture along the, uh, the first island chain and, and so forth. And do those trade-offs before you decide, gee, it's a good idea because it would impose costs on China. Okay, well, listen, uh, uh, thanks, Gonzo, and uh, gentlemen, uh, thank uh, each of you for your uh, insights. Um, as they demonstrate, uh, informing a broad audience on the need for next generation long range strike capabilities is really a, a team effort. Uh, General Nahum, uh, as a recovering programmer myself, uh, you're exactly right. It is extraordinarily challenging uh, to do the balancing that you have to be faced with. Uh, given a limited set of uh, uh, resources that you have uh, and uh, uh, fitting that all into um, uh, a, a balanced palm. Uh, now, we're going to do our best at Mitchell Institute to expand the perspectives of those in the defense community to look cross-service, not just inside every service, uh, and hopefully be able to uh, increase that budget authority that you're going to have or get in the future, hopefully. And General Winkler, uh, having spent a bit of time in the Pacific too, I know uh, our Naval friends are uh, fond of saying that the PACOM is uh, covered by 70% by water. I always like to remind them it's covered by 100% of air and space. And that in dealing with 16 time zones and the tyranny of distance, 
it is best conquered by going 600 plus knots, not 20 plus knots. So we wish you all the best while you're out there uh, in contributing uh, to meeting the needs of the Indo-PACOM uh, commander. And uh, on behalf of Mitchell Institute uh, and uh, all of AFA, we wish you best to you and your staffs as you define the future of America's uh, air power. Keep up the great work. Now, as a reminder to our listeners, um, our next event in our series will be with uh, General uh, Mobile Homes, Commander Air Combat Command on uh, Monday, uh, this coming Monday, the 22nd at 1.30. And I'd also like to remind you that uh, this report, uh, as well as uh, our proceedings, will okay. be on the uh, uh, Mitchell Institute uh, website later on today. Okay, folks, what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to questions from the audience who've been uh, listening in. Um, for those of you who have been listening in, please uh, raise your hand uh, using the uh, computer function uh, and announce uh, uh, your, who you are and uh, the organization that you are representing. Um, and while folks are waiting to jump in on those uh, questions, oh, there we go, John Turpak, go ahead. Yes, good afternoon, gentlemen, thanks very much. Uh, Mark, uh, some time ago you did a, uh, a study on uh, standoff munitions where you talked about the potential value of putting power units on some of the, uh, the smaller munitions to give them further range. Does your new study talk about that at all? Is there still a, a benefit to that? And a second question for everybody, General, General Ray has recently talked about a clean sheet arsenal plane to expand the long range strike cap capacity. I'd like you to uh, weigh in a little bit on that and, and compare that with your results in this study. Hey John, thank you for the question. Yeah, I've done uh, uh, previous reports on, um, on standoff weapons and actually you've taken a look at what's the sweet spot for standoff weapons? Because let's face it, even penetrating aircraft are going to need some standoff. And we found that the sweet spot is somewhere between 50 nautical miles standoff in highly contested threat environments to no more than 350, 400 nautical miles. Beyond that, the cost of the weapon, the size of the weapon grew to a point that it cut the weapons per sortie and the affordability of the weapon. So what we were saying was, could we take some of our direct attack weapons and modify them by giving them wings, small damn or or JDAM, or even power JDAM to increase their range a little bit and do so affordably uh, to support penetrating a, a strike uh, uh, operations. So that was the uh, genesis of, of what you asked about in those studies. In terms of the uh, clean sheet approach, we primarily took a look at uh, commercial derivatives. We compared it against uh, uh, PA Poseidon, uh, KC-46, and some other examples. And uh, we took a look at taking uh, commercial airlift aircraft and modifying them, what the technical challenges would be and the potential costs and so forth. And we didn't go deep into a new start uh, arsenal plane, but uh, if you look at it from taking an airplane that already exists and modifying it, uh, and the cost would be uh, about 400 million or so, weaponize it, and produce it uh, new versions of that, a clean sheet is probably going to match or exceed uh, that number. Okay. And anybody else wanna, wanna chime in on the arsenal plane there? It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a move from a half. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're, we're very close to General Ray and certainly with our, our designers as well. Um, you know, it, it's about um, massing firepower. So the idea, you know, could you get more long range weapons uh, where you could, you could actually mass more fires uh, in, a, in a conflict? Certainly stuff we're looking at. Um, the idea of our supply is certainly something uh, we're, we're, we're studying. Both, you know, how could we mass firepower better given you know, the size of the bomber fleet and as well as the fighters and, uh, and what other uh, our joint joint combined partners bring. Uh, right now, I would say it's just it's just that we're, we're looking at it, just seeing what the options are, and uh, and uh, and that that's about where we are from the half perspective. Hey, John, this is uh, uh, Deb Tula. Let me jump in here as well. 
and make sure that the uh, audience and, and, and as you are writing about this topic, uh, understands that the Air Force and the United States writ large, United States military, if we're to maintain our position as the world's sole superpower, um, we need to be able to succeed uh, across the spectrum of conflict. That means all the way from you know, humanitarian assistance, disaster response, all the way up to global thermonuclear war. And sometimes we tend to focus on a particular scenario. Uh, and what the majority of our time we've been talking about here are high-end scenarios. And that's extraordinarily important because we've neglected that role for the last, uh, going on 30 years now. But at the same time, the majority of the uh, contingencies that we operate in, uh, if you just look at history, um, they're going to be in relatively permissive airspace. Um, so there may be opportunities out there uh, to add the capacity, um, not by necessarily building an entirely new system, but coming up with innovative ways uh, to distribute lots and lots of munitions in permissive airspace using some of the airlift that's uh, already out there and available. So I just throw that into the equation because none of these things are either or. Uh, it's what both... Uh, uh, the generals who have m uh, met with us today, as well as Gonzo recognizes, it's a mix. Uh, so uh, for what it's worth, uh, let's go to our next question uh, from uh, Mr. Uh, Doug Berkey. Hey, sir. Thanks for taking my question. I'd like to talk a um, little bit about the potential budget cuts that might be coming down in light of the COVID-19 funding uh, issues in play. Could you please describe the risks that you would see the nation taking if the budget cuts were to impact the multiple long-range strike modernization efforts that are underway, efforts that have been delayed for quite some time? And, and sir, I, I guess uh, um, being the, the half guy, the money guy, I'll start out with this one. Um, yeah, I'll tell you, we have, we've got no guidance that budgets are coming down right now. Uh, so we are you know, still pr proceeding forward uh, with our, our next uh, uh, task is the uh, the 22 uh, president's budget submission which all that all that's uh, in, in work and we're, we're moving forward that being said we constantly what if you know we, we we've done this for years that, that i've been doing this uh, this work that well you know what if they took 10 percent away what if they took 15 percent you know, like numbers and we are certainly what ifing uh what a significant um different top line would look like it just it, it's proven to do so and it's going to be very challenging we're going to have to decide, uh, not only as an Air Force, but as a, um, a, a DOD uh, and country, about what we can and can't do. Because uh, maintaining legacy equipment in, in current day operations and modernizing, uh, right now we're about at the limit of being able to do that. Um, so we're going to have to decide what we can and can't do or how much modernizing we do. We do. Uh, we're going to have to look across services about what we do uh, that's redundant. We're going to have to look at um, you know, how we, how we leverage allies and partners differently. We're going to have to look at things differently. Um, I think we're, we in the Air Force, we're in a good position to do so. I think we've got a lot of great modernization programs moving forward. Um, I think we could certainly ramp some things up if we, were, if we needed to. We could also slow some things down if we need to. I also think we in the Air Force have got a lot of legacy equipment doing current day operations. Uh, and we're just going to have to look at what, what we can um, reduce uh, uh, out there so we can bring some of those legacy operations down. I'll tell you, the bombers, is around long range strike, the bombers are a perfect example. You know, the B-21s are just getting started right now. Um, if you look at Gonzo's chart there, he showed us having the B-21s start to fly around. Uh, I think he was showing them starting to show up at FY24. You know, you, you've heard the, uh, the, the releases when we think we're going to be operational. And then the other bombers starting to go away about six, seven years after that. So that's about a six or seven year overlap when we in the Air Force have to maintain a four bomber fleet. I'm here to tell you that's that between for money and manpower, that is a very, very difficult thing, that, that four bomber fleet. So we're looking at ways as how we can how we reduce that that time frame. Because we know the future of the bomber is in the B-21 and a modified B-52. And so that, those are some of the things that are going to be on our mind if budgets start getting tight about how, how we handle this and still modernize. It's over. Thanks, Abu. Jekyll, any comments on that one? 
You know, sort of like in the interest of time, I'll uh, disagree with General Nahum and defer all things POM related to, to him. So I'll, I'll hold comments. Oh, boy, they, they you learned well when you went through uh, ca to the capstone, uh, didn't you? Uh, very, very nice. Well done. Okay, General Stutzream, you've got a question for our uh, panelists. Yeah, this one's for uh, General Winkler. You know, there's some great work going on out there, uh, putting some sense into fighting from the bases that it's not all about getting as far away as we can because that, that marker will continue to migrate. Uh, and so the distributed operations, the logistics to go along with that. I'm just curious whether, uh, how you see that affecting choices in terms of the stand in and stand out balance that Gonzo's proposed. Do you see uh, there an ability to uh, fight from those bases at some point in the near future? Uh, thanks for the question, sir. I really appreciate it. It's going to allow me to hit on one of General Brown's main points out here in the Pacific Theater. Um, and I'll apologize for the, the confusion of terminology. I'm going to use stand in right now in a slightly different way than we have for the rest of the presentation. And when I'm talking about stand in forces for this context, I'm going to be talking about forces that are stationed underneath the adversary's anti-access area umbrella, basically under the threat of cruise and ballistic missile attack. Uh, in the first or the second island chain out here in the Pacific. Uh, we're pretty convinced out here in the Pacific, and I think you safety if they were on the line in Europe would tell you the same thing. If we take all of our Air Force assets and retreat to the point that our forces are no longer threatened by our adversaries' capabilities, we are going to mortgage our, our critical, uh, critical alliance or our critical network of allies and partners uh, we think it's sort of untenable from their perspective to think that, you know, the United States Air Force is, we're going to be there to support you in any kind of conflict, but we're going to do it from 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 miles away uh, is just not a compelling argument. Uh, so in order to assure our allies of our commitment to the theater, you know, we want to be right next to them, uh, shoulder to shoulder uh, in the face of a conflict. And to be honest with you, uh, General Deptula mentioned that the, the peer fight is something that we haven't really... Um, put in a position of predominance or invested heavily in in the past. And that's been because we've, uh, you know, we've been utterly engaged in, in more permissive parts of the theater. Uh, but I really, really think that we're, we're seeing a sea change in the way that the Department of Defense faces that uh, anti-access area denial umbrella, the combination of cruise and ballistic missiles. Um, and, and we're starting to take it seriously. And I know that we're gonna find a way to be able to do it so that we can be right alongside of our allies and partners. The other point I'd bring up there is that we're, you know, we're struggling to figure out uh, exactly how we're going to be able to do logistics under attack, because if we've got forces fielded underneath the threat, then our, our logistics, our supply trains, our support structures need to be able to penetrate as well to keep that force uh, well-fed, well-equipped, and, and to continue to have the capability to fight. So uh, I really appreciate the question. Hopefully the, the stand-in used in that context uh, still made sense. Uh, but, but we definitely need to have those capabilities to assure our allies of our commitment to, to any kind of theater, really, regardless of whether you're in the Pacific or, or Europe. Hey, Jekyll, thanks very much for that. And uh, thank you both. We've uh, now come to the end of our uh, uh, time for uh, the rollout of our long range strike uh, paper. Uh, and uh, uh, listening to both of you uh, from a uh, uh, older, I won't say really old, but uh, older general officer's perspective, it uh, really uh, uh, is in incredibly satisfying to see uh, that men of your stature, caliber, and intellect, intellect are uh, running the Air Force today. So thank you for what you continue to do. Your perspectives in, in an incredibly challenging set of uh, times. Uh, and uh, thanks, Abu, and uh, mahalo to Jekyll. Uh, go out there and have a Mai Tai at the end of the day for me, please. So from the Mitchell Institute, uh, have a great aerospace power kind of day out here. Thank you.